After the easygoing but not exactly groundbreaking Christmas episode, Lorne was determined to emerge from the holiday break with a strong show. Everyone else got a few weeks off, but Lauren, Chevy, and Michael O'Donohue spent the time on floor 17 of 30 Rockefeller Plaza working on new material. By that point, I'd hit stride. We all had, and everyone was focused. The Gould Show was our first big show, which wasn't about the host. Gould was just a big, goofy guy who'd been in MASH, Lauren says, and live from New York. This episode was submitted to the Television Academy for consideration in the writing category, and against all common sense, it won. Now, I'm not saying it was a bad episode by any means, just that it's perfectly average compared to the rest of the first season. Gould is likable, but adds nothing of substance to his sketches. He famously summarized his contribution to the episode's standout Godfather parody as, I smoked a pipe. And though the sketches are strong enough, the pacing suffers. Pre-tape pieces by both the incoming and outgoing resident filmmakers, the worst Muppet sketch yet, and the bewildering choice of Anne Murray as a musical guest all lend a disjointed and haphazard feel to this one, if you ask me. But it was obviously good enough for the Academy. Frankly, we all know that the Emmys are as much about buzz as about substance, and nobody could deny that NBC Saturday Night was generating buzz. Elliot Gould's life and career in the first five years of the 1970s had been a roller coaster of triumphs and minor tragedies. Proclaimed by Time magazine to be a star for an uptight age, he began the decade with a genuine star maker of a film in MASH, but seemingly then had problems finding projects that suited him. His film adaptation of the 1971 novel A Glimpse of Tiger had been aborted after only a few short days' work amid reports of erratic and possibly drug-fueled behavior by Gould, and his marriage to Barbara Streisand failed around the same time. He'd had a major comeback, though, with 1973's The Long Goodbye, and his movie career was in pretty solid shape by the time Lauren tapped him to host SNL's first episode of 1976. Speaking strictly in terms of box office numbers, Gould was by far the biggest host the show had featured so far, and his appearance demonstrated to yet another potential audience that this new program would have a wide variety of guests who'd appeal to a wide variety of folks. In lieu of a monologue, Gould saunters out wearing a hideous jacket that heralds the new year in spectacular 70s-tastic fashion, banters a bit about the hockey game, and stumbles into a jaunty show tune backed by Paul Schaefer. It's absolutely inconsequential. Gould's singing voice is serviceable at best, but he somehow still manages to come off as a likable guy who'll make a good host. Lorne must have agreed, because he came back several more times during the first five years of SNL, as well as one final, rather disastrous appearance during the lorne sixth season. I wouldn't say he's one of the more consequential hosts in the history of the show, but he was one of the earliest to reach the so-called Five Timers Club. His first appearance is a strong enough start. Don't get me wrong, I adore Anne Murray's voice, and I find some of her material incredibly comforting. My mom used to listen to this kind of schmaltzy stuff in the car, and I have a soft spot. Just, why is she on SNL? My only guess is maybe Gould was a fan. I'll put it this way, the combination of Gould as host and Murray as guest seems like the sort of thing that would give Mike O'Donoghue a toothache. They both seem just a bit too saccharine for the show's aesthetic, but perhaps that's why they submitted this particular episode to the MEP. In any event, Murray performs a lovely rendition of an early track she'd re-recorded recently titled Long Distance Call, as well as a frankly flummoxing and more than a little bit embarrassing up-tempo number called Boogie With You from that year's album Together. Poor Anne does not have a funky bone in her body, and she really should stick to ballads with overly lush string sections, if you ask me. Jeez, we get a very abbreviated anal beads joke for the phone gag this week. He hung up practically before the words got out of his mouth, but it's pretty clear where he was headed with it. I'm Chevy Chase, and you're not. Got zero reaction this week. I mean, zero. Let's see if they keep it up. In current events this week, a campaigning Gerald Ford kissed a snowball and threw a baby while in New Hampshire. The snowball will be kept for posterity in the new Ford wing of the Smithsonian, dedicated to cataloging Ford's many, many, many clumsy exploits as president. And finally, the FBI and the CIA are merging to form the ICAFIB MOUSE. <laughs> They keep getting Angelo's Pizza instead of Angola the country on the phone. They keep iterating on this one. Update really seems to get a kick out of putting racist jokes into the mouths of racist politicians. Funny how that gives them license to get racist jokes past standards and practices. Usually it's George Wallace. This week they chose Senator Robert Byrd, but I'm still uncomfortable with how readily the mostly white audience chuckled at these. Richard Pryor had been so offended by this particular gag that he threatened to smash Michael O'Donohue's head in with a crevassier bottle over its inclusion on Pryor's episode. I guess they filed it away for use on a wider show. 
Lorraine reports from Cape Canaveral. In a bid to rid the world of dangerous nerve gas, it's been decided to launch all of it into space on a Saturn V rocket. We then watch as enough nerve gas to kill everything on the planet descends into the atmosphere, only for the rocket to disintegrate. Cheerful little gag here that was absolutely written by Michael O'Donoghue. Speak of the devil, the Jamatol ad from episode one is back and still slightly creepy. O'Donoghue, as the wife, comes on this week after the ad and argues at Chevy like an old mother hen. I still can't figure out if they're making fun of gay people or not here, honestly. Other than Michael's slightly hectoring tone, he and Chevy are pretty much portrayed like normal people, which on some level counts as pretty good representation for the era, I guess. Chevy announces the arrival of a dangerous strain of killer dope in New York and exhorts viewers to simply place a small sample of the suspected cannabis in an envelope and send it immediately to Chevy Chase, apartment 12, 827 West 81st Street, New York City, 10053. I was saddened to learn that, at the insistence of NBC's legal folks, the address given was a fake, which would have been somewhere in the middle of the Hudson River. I guess they weren't really getting hundreds of joints in the mail at 30 Rock, although the one pictured on screen in this update was reportedly the genuine article, unbeknownst to the higher-ups. We have some real-world NBC hijinks. Chevy tells us NBC has introduced its new logo, developed at staggering cost over a period of more than a year. The new NBC logo was found to be strikingly similar, however, to the logo for the Nebraska Educational Network, a group of PBS-affiliated stations around Lincoln, Nebraska. NETV had indeed spent less than $100 to develop its logo, just as Chevy says. NETV sued NBC for copyright infringement shortly after this episode aired, and the case was ultimately settled out of court. NBC paid legal fees, funded the development of a new logo for NETV, and donated hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment to avoid further litigation. Chevy then shows us the runner-up designs the network also considered. It's a great gag. It's also worth pointing out that there's some great wordplay in this one. The various businesses, starting with N, which are filing lawsuits against NBC, have some excellent gag names. I can totally see a bunch of professional comedy writers sitting around stoned off their asses coming up with the most bizarre N-named businesses they could muster, and the results are delightful. Norton Suppository Cleaners and Nearer My Dog to Thee Pet Burial Service are freaking solid, if you ask me. Finally, instead of Garrett doing the hard of hearing thing to close update, Chevy does the most generically broad comedy accent possible for the benefit of their foreign viewers. Props to Chevy for doing a good job with the gibberish language as it sounds suitably like lots of different kinds of languages all at the same time. However, there's no way in hell this would air today. The bit isn't mean-spirited, but it's generally less acceptable to poke fun of other languages and the folks who speak them these days. Yeah, I'm not going to do this Muppet sketch. Sorry. Nope, 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 nope. I'm as helpless as a kitten up a tree. Gary Weiss submits a strange film of lots of different jazz pianists playing the song Misty, all edited together. It's an odd pastiche, and knowing what problems they'd later have with staying within their time budget, it's strange to see such a pointless film taking up three minutes. It's a slight and inconsequential introduction to Weiss, whose films took a generally warmer and less biting tone than Albert Brooks's. We'll discuss Weiss more in later episodes, but this first film of his isn't a particularly strong start to his contributions. It's not Muppets level awful, but it's otherwise the weakest element in this week's episode. Albert Brooks visits the National Audience Research Institute for his final film. It got some solid laughs out of me, and it's probably my favorite of the season. In it, he assures us that he has no qualms about artistic integrity and that he's willing and able to change in any direction you choose, so long as it makes him popular. I've kind of grown to appreciate Brooks's needy auteur shtick. It must have been pretty groundbreaking stuff at the time. I certainly don't know of any earlier filmmakers quite like him. Lorne Michaels and Brooks would both go on to have mildly bruised egos and hurt feelings about the details surrounding Brooks's departure from the show. You're not funny. But I am funny. Do you understand that? I hate you. You're not funny. But Brooks's career was about to get a huge shot in the arm with his appearance in Scorsese's classic Taxi Driver just a month later. Things turned out just fine for both him and for the show, so it's probably best for all involved that he left at this point. The Dead String Quartet is one of the more high-concept Chevy Falls Down openers so far. The show starts with about 30 seconds of literal dead air. Get it? Until Danny begins a tip-over chain reaction among the members of the quartet, culminating with Final Domino Chevy toppling from the stage to deliver his line. Night. 
There's a running gag throughout this episode where Gilda and Elliot apparently had a fling the night before, and Gilda's getting all clingy about it while Gould is standoffish and cool. She comes out at various points in the episode to pester him and ask him about his thoughts and feelings about their night together. It's all played fairly straight. Over the course of the episode, she introduces Gould to her mom and assures him he'll never have to take her name, stuff like that. We'll come back to this bit at the end of the episode. In which Elliot and Chevy demolish the place while Jane Curtin protests that they probably have the wrong house. This one actually had the potential to go very poorly for them. They really wrecked shit up. There was glass and wood shards flying everywhere and nobody wore any goggles. And they exploded a damn television with a flying hammer toss, for God's sake. It's a miracle nobody got hurt, and I can only imagine it was a bit of a faff striking the set to prepare for the next sketch. Hilariously, Jane is supposed to throw a vase at the wall and break it to end the sketch, only it doesn't break and the joke doesn't land, or at least it lands differently than they intended. Throw harder next time, Jane. Further establishing that Belushi is one talented SOB, we have a group therapy session here centered around him as the Godfather. It's perfect comedy Brando, but I could see it being terrifying if he'd had a chance to try something similarly intense in a dramatic role. The sketch itself is a bit of an odd duck. It's really two character studies in one piece, and I guess the juxtaposition works? Belushi's Corleone exits the scene with a few minutes left, and the therapy session continues on to Lorraine Sherry as if there wasn't, you know, a corpse on the floor. The Godfather was fresh in the cultural conscious at the time, so this probably worked well for the Emmy folks, come to think of it. There's some strong gags in this one, and the characterizations are solid, but the framework of the sketch is a bit ragged, and it doesn't flow all that well. Just as Gould said, he's a non-factor here, and mostly just stays out of the way of the other two. New Shimmer Floor Wax Dessert Topping is a pretty good fake ad, as well as a pretty good floor wax and dessert topping. Chevy nails the essential fakeness of the pitch man, and Danny getting so worked up over his debate with Gilda always makes me giggle. It's a dessert topping, you cow! Here, Belushi and Gold lead a raiding party of South American killer bees into the house of Chevy and Gilda. The whole thing is a parody of westerns, but with Mexican killer bees replacing the stereotypical Hispanic villains from those films. They hold the family hostage. Do as I say, senor, your wife dies! Some laughter ensues. Their Latino mannerisms are, again, uncomfortably broad to me watching in 2021. It's like terrible western levels of offensive Mexican bad guy stereotyping, all performed by a bunch of white dudes and Garrett. The sketch appears to be going nowhere. Gould breaks into a dramatic monologue about how it's tough living the life of a poor worker bee, and the camera cuts away from him only to linger strangely on Belushi and Garrett. Belushi finally stops the scene. Uh, I think there's some kind of technical difficulty here. Uh, uh, well, the camera's been on us all during your speech. I think it should be the other way around. That's true, Ellie. I know the same thing. I don't know what it is. But they keep having more and more camera issues. Lauren comes out to apologize, then goes out to yell at the director. I can see now, by the way, why Lorne doesn't appear on screen very often. He's playing himself here, and he's still not very convincing. Anyway, he reaches the director only to find him passed out drunk, then proceeds to wake him up and smack him around a little. Belushi narrates the whole thing, telling us how he'd hate to be in Lorne's shoes right now because poor Lorne has to fire that director, who it turns out is his own dad? That's a weird twist, but whatever. It's a really interesting way to frame this gag if you think about it. Put a bad sketch at the front, the real sketch in the middle, and then end it with a second cutaway ending such as here where Gilda needily interrupts Gould again to bring her mom out to meet him. All in all, this sketch is a good example of what separated NBC Saturday Night from earlier sketch shows. This sort of fourth wall breaking humor where the show itself and the making of it became elements of the material was new to network TV and very much a signifier of the type of audience the show wanted to attract. In much the same way Looney Tunes had not been written to make children laugh, but to cater to the writer's own sense of humor, SNL assumed its audience would find funny whatever the writers found funny. If they didn't, then the show wasn't for them. Thankfully, the audience was usually willing to go along for the ride, at least in these early years. Another Jane-hosted interview show, this time with experts discussing various birthing methods. Ackroyd is a French obstetrician and proponent of the Levoine method, which he demonstrates to the crowd. It's a 70s take on natural childbirth and actually seems quite reasonable, although the crowd giggles at Ackroyd's accent. Gould then demonstrates the American way, which he describes as Pearl Harbor and is as horrifying as you might expect. I can't help but compare it to the later similar but stronger Monty Python piece on childbirth from The Meaning of Life, but this sketch stands pretty well as its forebearer.
New talent, Franken and Davis, with adorable curly 70s hair and rental tuxedos, close out the night in the dreaded 1 a.m. slot. It's the final sketch of the evening, and it's often where rejected sketches go to die. They set the scene as a news show, which airs from an alternate universe where the Native Americans won all the wars and control America. They play Native American sports journalists who are discussing happenings in the professional lacrosse league, and they keep casually referring to offensive team names like the Milwaukee Dagos and the Cleveland Kikes. He goes on to graphically explain what these team names mean and just, wow, times were different. I get that they're obviously trying to contextualize casual white racism towards Native Americans by saying lots of racist things about white folks while in character as alternate universe Native Americans, but regardless of context, it would cause a write-in campaign in a segment on Fox News if it aired today, even in reruns. I doubt the MAGA folks would find the hero in Al Frickin' Franken mocking racist white people in their racist sports team names. Aside from any questions of who might be offended by it, it's too long. The point is made and maximum Al Franken smugness has been reached long before the sketch exhausts itself. Considering what time of night it aired though, they probably wrote it to be the length they needed to fill, so I don't guess I can blame them for that. Gould says about his first hosting gig, through the show, there was this thread where Gilda Radner had a crush on me, and at the end of the show that I did, we married. Gilda and I had a wedding ceremony, and Madeline Kahn's mother was cast as Gilda's mother, and Michael O'Donoghue married us at the end of the show. And that was the representative show they submitted, and it won them their first Emmy. I was really pleased to be a part of it. Indeed, Gould and all involved seemed to have had a good week. The crowd was warming up to the material, which itself was becoming more consistent. Momentum was building. They were getting better and better reviews from critics, whom it must be said had not been initially smitten by the show. The next week's installment would introduce another notable repeat host and character actor, Buck Henry, who became sort of an honorary not ready for primetimer after hosting a record ten times in his first five seasons. Stay tuned!